wavelength, so I can do spectroscopy down in the infrared, maybe. So I sat down with a paper and pencil, and you know, let's see how can we get the shorter wavelengths. And I wrote down equations, and hey, looks like we can get right on down the light waves. Oh boy, wow! And that was exciting. I knew that because Mason was so excited. If I said anything about it, a lot of people would jump into the field. They weren't interested without my mentioning it, but I thought if I, if I mentioned it and said it could be done, then uh, I'd have a lot of competition. So I didn't mention it to anybody, I just kept thinking about it. And I was consulting for Bell Telephone Laboratories then, and my brother-in-law, Art Charlotte, had married my kid sister, he'd been a postdoc with me, and married my kid sister, which I was very pleased. He'd gone to Bell Labs, working there. I went and saw him, and I told him about it. He said, well, you know, I've been wondering about that. Could we work on it together? I said, well, sure, okay. So he had a, he added something. He had the idea of having two parallel plane mirrors like this with light going straight back and forth, like a very pure directional amplifier then. I had thought of having just a cavity and the light would bounce all around. Well, here he, he recognized it, two parallel mirrors like this, and he'd been working on a fabric row uh, for fabric pro uh, system for for very precise spectral measurements, and that's why he had this idea. So we put that together, and again we decided, well, <coughs> we, we better publish a theoretical paper. We started working on it experimentally. Somebody certainly would compete and uh, might beat us to it, so we better mention it in theoretical paper, which we did. But first, let's take it to the Bell. You take it to Bell Laboratories lawyers and have them patent it because we probably ought to give it to Bell Labs. So he took the Bell Labs lawyers. He called me up a couple of days later and said, well, Bell Labs lawyers says they don't want to bother the patent it uh, because light's never been used for communication. And uh, Michael even tried it a little bit and didn't work. And so he said, if you want a patent it, you just patent it. You can take the patent. You know, we won't bother. I told him, look, I, they just don't understand. You go tell them, yes, it can be used for communication. So he called me back. A couple of days later, said, well, the lawyers there say, if, if we can show it can be used in communication, okay, they'll patent it for Bell Labs. Well, I thought we shouldn't rob Bell Labs of it just because the lawyers didn't understand. So I said, okay. So <coughs> we wrote a patent, said optical maser, optical masers and communication. And that was, the, that was the patent on the laser. I already had the basic patent for masers for all, and I included all wavelengths, even though I hadn't been able to see just how to build light waves. This was, another, this was a basic patent on the laser itself, which Bell Laboratories and we gave to Bell, gave to Bell Telephone Laboratories. Uh, <clears throat> well, now, um, we published it. 1958 publication came out. Then everybody jumped into the field, and I knew they would. By then, industry had hired a lot of the students who worked on masers and microwave amplifiers and so on, masers. So industry had all, a lot of skillful people and they jumped in the field very quickly. And all the first lasers were built in industry. All the first lasers were built in industry. They could work very fast, of course, and quickly. And when, once they found, once they knew it was interesting, <coughs> the very first laser was built at the Hughes Laboratory by Ted Maimon. He used a ruby laser. He used a ruby. Well, now I thought about ruby and Art Shallow and I thought about ruby, but Ruby, it uh, decayed fast enough that we thought, well, we couldn't get enough light to ex excite enough of them. But Maimon recognized he could use a pulse light, use a pulse and get much more intensity in with a pulse than he could get intensity. So this is a pulse laser. It just was very, very bright, very briefly, but at least it was, uh, it was a laser and oscillating. Now, pretty soon it got called lasers because we first called it an optical laser as it was a maser, just extending on down to shorter wavelengths. But uh, optical maser was too long, a, too long a name and became laser. And uh, we thought, well, after that, maybe it could be all kind of, maybe the gamma ray would be a gazer. Uh, <laughs> but of course, laser, lasers now include everything, even down, down to the X-ray region. Uh, and uh, lasers go up to about, well, up to a millimeter, and after a millimeter, we call them masers. Well, longer wavelengths, they're masers, shorter wavelengths, they're lasers, but it's basically the same thing, of course. Well, <clears throat> first one was invented by Maimon at Hughes, and then the next one was one of my students, Javon, uh, Javon Bennett and Harriet at Bell Telephone Laboratories. Uh, they made the first continuous laser, 
which is what I had been interested in, and may have gas, a gas discharge, that's the kind I was been thinking of, and Javon built it and made it work. Then the third one was a Sorokin and Stevenson. Stevenson has been one of my students, has gone to General Electric. So General Electric made the, made the third new kind of uh, laser. And so it happened. Just more and more lasers, and they come in all varieties now, enormous big ones, very, very small ones, and they're made of a lot of different things, all kinds of wavelengths and so on. And of course, you know, it's, it's a very, very big business and industry now. And there are, there are many, many applications. For example, for medicine, it's been very important for medical applications. I never thought of medical applications. That never, never occurred to me it'd be useful for medicine. Uh, I thought, well, it can burn people, but you know, why do you want to do that? <laughs> well, of course, it does a lot of things. Uh, it's used on, the, used on the eyes. I've even had an eye, a little eye operation uh, with, with, with a laser. <coughs> And um, now, um, was it, the field just grew and grew, and people all over the world were working on them and inventing new things. Um, and I'm delighted how useful it's been in science. It's produced an enormous amount of new science. And that was what I was primarily interested in, uh, getting a new scientific tool. It can measure, some, measure things more precisely in wavelength, more precisely in frequency, measure, measure distances more precisely than we had before, get frequencies more accurate than we had before, and so on. Uh, and uh, all kinds of new discoveries. Interesting that can be, you focus a laser, enormously high power, I get very high power, you can get, um, uh, let's see, 500,000 billion watts on a laser, and you can focus it to a point uh, just a couple of microns in size. Just think of the intensity of energy. That many watts focused to about a, a, a light wave in size. Intensity, of, uh, intensity is enormous. So we can get the highest temperature or the highest temp intensity. It also produces the lowest temperatures we have. With lasers, you can cool things off. You can grasp atoms and hold them still, make them stiller and stiller, and essentially zero motion. The atoms, you grab them in zero motion and get, get the lowest possible temperatures. And it's produced uh, a lot of Nobel Prizes. Been th 13 Nobel Prizes, other than the one that I got with the Russians. The Russians had a somewhat similar idea. They didn't really build the first laser. But they had me, they were working on it, and uh, so they got some credit, and they, they got half the Nobel Prize, and I got the other half the Nobel Prize in 1964. But other than, other than those, there were 13 additional, no, there have been 13 additional Nobel Prizes given as a result of using measures or lasers as tools, as a scientific tool to do new things, which we couldn't do before. And I'm uh, just absolutely delighted with that. Of course, uh, it's also been economically very important. All kinds of industrial uses have come out. I hadn't, I hadn't really been all that interested or expected industrial uses. I knew there were some. Of course, communication is what occurred to me, obviously, originally, and it's been it's enormously important in communication now. And you can put so much information on one light beam, enormous amount of information on one light beam, and. Uh, Light beams over little fibers and so on are uh, just uh, uh, very, uh, very important communication ta ta uh, technique now. But, uh, all kinds of industries have grown up uh, using very small lasers, very little point things, very big lasers for powerful things. As uh, I say, the lasers, lasers uh, are the most powerful sources of energy now. Uh, of energy concentration especially. And an industry, I suppose there's maybe $20 billion of, per year of in industrial production. Now it's, it's a very, very big industry. I don't know the exact numbers, but it's a very big industry in a, in a wide variety of things. And it's all over the world. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, this is what happens with new discoveries. And I think it's very important 
new discoveries. And how do you make new discoveries? Well, you notice, as I say, some new discoveries come about by accident, but some new discoveries come about as a result of hard work. But it's all a result of hard, intense work. The accidental things come about by careful looking, carefully looking at things, and you see something that you recognize as new. People haven't seen before, and then, hey, what is that? Wow. And, uh, well, the um, w one accident, one accident was the transistor, another accident the beginning of the universe, another accident the discovery of America. Uh, those are some of the accidental ones. Those are some systematic ones, and the lasers may be a particular case of a systematic examination of trying to do something. And finally, after some years of effort, and hitting on the right thing eventually, why, um, I discovered how to do it, make the maser and, uh, maser and the laser. <coughs> uh, <coughs> and um, I'm just delighted with how important it's become. But a lot of other people have made it important. Uh, sure, I initiated the idea uh, and got it started, uh, but uh, I didn't build the first laser. All the first lasers, I say, were built in industry. I built the first maser, and I showed how to make the laser, but uh, with large shallow. But all the first ones were built in, in, in industry, and industry has contributed a lot. Scientists have been, universities have contributed a lot. There's been many con contributions all over the world. And that's the great thing about science and technology. People trade ideas, interactions. Interactions of different fields are important in creating new things. Interactions of different people are important in creating new things. And uh, my own interaction with individuals helped provide me with some new ideas. Um, I might just mention another one. I, was, uh, <clears throat> I, I went to Japan after I had been in Paris on my sabbatical leave, and in Japan I ran into a biologist uh, named Ryan, whom I had known back in the United States, and he was visiting over there too on sabbatical. I said, what are you doing? Oh, he said, you know, I've, I've, I've been trying to figure out get equations that dis dis discuss, that, that can show the fluctuations in a population of microorganism. Now a microorganism can die, or it can double and reduce another one, and if they add and subtract that way, how do you figure out what's the fluctuations, what's going to be the f amount of fluctuations in, in the population of microorganism? That's what he was trying to figure out. I said, hey, oh, that's just what I want for the, uh, that's what, just what I want for the maser and the laser. I want the statistics of the population, and the same thing, a photon can be absorbed, it can die, it can stimulate additional radiation, make two, but then there's spontaneous emission, which is just one additional thing, is that it creates itself. Uh, microorganisms can't create themselves, but they can multiply or they can die. I said, well, I will add one term to your equations and let's work on it together. So we worked on those equations together and got statistics, and so this way uh, I could figure out what's the noise in a microwave amplifier and was able to show that that's be the most sensitive amplifier that could be built. And it's the most sensitive amplifier possible. And it is, and can, be, and, and can, and can detect things right on down to one photon. Uh, so uh, we showed that theoretically, and see this, in, these interactions, interactions in different fields are very, very important uh, to all fields. And uh, also, we must be willing to explore, and be willing to differ with other people. See, Robbie and Cush both wanted me to stop, they knew, they knew it wouldn't work. Bohr thought, oh no, that's not possible, that can't, that can't be. Uh, well, new ideas are new, and especially people who don't have them, they're not, they don't, they, they, they're sometimes kind of negative about them. But we've be, got to be willing to differ with other people, especially uh, outstanding people. We've got to be, we think hard about whether we're really right, just don't waste our time, but if you think you've got, really got a chance, be willing to try something new. So I hope all of you will do that. Think about new things, things that things will be good, things will be helpful to people. Do them, be willing to take some chances, and explore. Thank you very much.